Um, but I'm curious to hear from you, Jean-Philippe, about you know, how you came to this narrative and specifically, you know, it, this is an interesting book about both time and memory because the entire book takes place on a train ride. That's right. Uh, it's okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, I was interested in uh, unity of place, unity of time and memory. And, well, the idea, you know, I, I take this train, this early morning train, very often. And uh, like you, well, well, of course, we're in the USA, so when you take the plane, <laughs> when you don't take the train, uh, <laughs> You, you start. You you take the train, and then you bring with you books and magazines and things, and then you realize that you don't read. You just watch uh, watch people around and and think. And I was interested in that. I, I think there's something really. That there might be a cultural gap between uh, American uh, readers and French readers because I think that in this situation, uh, American people would tend to talk to the other. <laughs> I agree. French people don't. <laughs> they just, you know, they're so self-conscious and they just sit like that up straight. <laughs> And just saying, oh no, I don't, rec I don't recognize you. I, I don't want to be acknowledged. Right. Um, it's it's the, the two kind of main characters in this book, um, a woman uh, named uh, Cécile, Cécile yeah. uh, and you know, this, this other man named Philippe Leduc. Uh, they're very different people. Uh, and it's not as if they're reflecting on this you know, love affair necessarily with great fondness. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a complicated, yeah. and, and not necessarily a long, it's not like they dated or were lovers for a long time, but it, was, it seems to be for both of them an episode that kind of was a catalyst for the people that they became. Yeah, that, well, it, it, it lasted only four months. It ended in a catastrophe, yeah. with humiliation. But it definitely changed their lives. And they realize it during the train ride. Mm. They have never thought about it before, but uh, they realize that she realizes that she has become the woman she is now. That is to say, that is to say stylish entrepreneur, uh, yeah, full of self-confidence, that she wasn't when she was younger. Uh, and she uh, decided to take control of her life when she was humiliated by him. And he, Philippe Le Duc, the Duke, <laughs> yeah, is, is, you know, is, is that kind of popular guy that we all met in high school, <laughs> you know. And, and he realized that he acted like a jerk 27 years before, and it made him lose confidence and then gradually climb down the ladder of success. Right. So that's, right. yeah, so that's uh, actually, uh, that was interesting. The, the way they, uh, their lives crossed at one moment changed, the, uh, definitely changed their lives. And to give you kind of a sense of these, these two people on the train, um, Cecile is, is kind of made herself into a, a kind of sophisticated yeah. businesswoman. Yeah. Um, she's someone who is kind of a commanding thinker, you know, someone who, who doesn't have patience for, um, you know, what, what is a good description of it? She, she doesn't suffer fools. But here, here is, she, she recognizes who is sat down next to her, and, and she's, this is her speaking. Um, uh, and she's saying she could, you know, ordinarily she would move to another seat or, you know, she's someone who, if the food was disgusting, she would tell you. But she says, I am the epitome of the difficult customer. And then she's, you know, describing whether or not she should move. But this time I can't. It's impossible. It's as if my feet were glued to the floor. I'm a tin soldier. It's incredible as if I were a teenager all over again, and it annoys me. 
especially as I had planned to sink into the novel and enjoy the ride from Toya to Paris as a sort of interlude, a long, deep breath of fresh air before the turmoil of the week ahead. It's unbearable. Well, we, we all suff suffered from uh, love and breakups, and mm -hmm. I mean, we all, but when we were 20 or 25, but if we could see the one who made us suffer at that moment, 30 years later, ooh, my <laughs> God, we wouldn't cry. <laughs> I mean, because Philippe Le Duc has changed for the worst. Right. Right. It's fattened, yeah. is, is, I mean, is ugly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so she realizes that, oh my God, <laughs> I'm a lot better than he is now, right? Another quality to this book that I think is worth mentioning um, for those of you who haven't read it is that it's also a very compassionate book in the sense that these, these two people, you know, begin kind of forgiving the other person um, and in a sense forgive themselves for some of the decisions they've made. Yeah, I mean, they're 47. <laughs> I was 47 when I wrote it. Mm. I thought it was time I, I began to forgive myself and to, and to forgive the others. Too. I mean, time, that's the effect of time too. Right. Right? Yeah, when you start saying, okay, saying, and seeing the world differently from a different ang angle. Yeah, and, and I love them anyway. So, yeah, both of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 6.14 to Paris. So, moving from this book to, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about Pedro Carmona Alvarez's book. Um, the weather changed, summer came, and so on. The catalyst in this book, rather than being this kind of love affair, is instead a, a really tragic moment that that kind of explodes um, these people's lives. Uh, and we know what, what that tragedy is early on in this book. We, we see that there's you know, this attractive couple and they have two daughters and their daughters are, are killed. And it, you feel like this is a very dramatic episode, um, but what's so um, interesting and touching and I think interesting about this story is that it really unfolds from this other sister who is born after these two daughters have died. And she ends up kind of setting this story in motion. Um, and she tells the story about her parents. Um, and I'm curious to hear from you, Pedro, about how you know, this, you know, this kind of narrative of you know, loss, um, but it's also this tender story between a daughter and her father. Um, how did that unfold in your imagination? Well, this is, um, hello? <laughs> this is awful sound, right? It sounds like it's a feedback somewhere. Or, yeah, it's okay? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, this book was uh, actually never meant to be uh, written. I, I had a novel finished in 2011, and uh, it was going to be called Dokkevejen. There's a street in my hometown in Norway, in Bergen, called Dokkevejen. It's, it's uh, Dahl's Way. Dokkevejen Revisited, it was going to be called because I love Bob Dylan's uh, Highway 61 Revisited. <laughs> So, uh, and I had that novel finished, and uh, it was about a lot of things, and there was this little tiny story, 19 pages, in that um, novel that um, was about this guy called Johnny Richards, a guy who was born and raised in New Jersey, and he, he had been living in Norway for several years, and then went back to the United States in the beginning of the 80s, and he sat on this beach after his father had died. Mm. And uh, that was it, that was the, the thing about him. And that 19 pages long thing in the novel was too big for that novel or too small for that, I didn't mm. know. And I had this bad feeling about the whole, the whole thing. And I thought that it was just self-doubt and you know, 
bad you know uh, self esteem as we writers often have and uh, and suddenly at the end of the summer the book is, was going to be published and everything was finished and the cover was finished and i just uh, called my editor up and said stop the press <laughs> and, uh, and then i said i have to do i have to write um, johnny's story and the daughter's story and make that uh, uh, a book so so it's, it was just uh, a tiny fragment of a bigger work that didn't work out as i thought it would that was the beginning of it and um and the story it's uh, i i don't know i just had this vision of this girl talking about her father's life and her family's life and and that intrigued me the the thought of being a child that is born into a family that has a, such a big loss and like growing up as a as an echo of uh, of the dead sisters and and how 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 do you cope with that being always a reminder of some you're the one that survived right. and the others didn't so uh that was the the starting point for the book yeah and she's she's a very interesting young woman as we kind of are introduced to her in the book um we we gather that she's someone who has always asked lots of questions um and she's not someone who really knew the story of her her parents, um, it wasn't something that her parents wanted to share. So as the book um, progresses, you get the sense of how, how she has found the pieces of this story and put it together. Um, but the book, book starts out um, you know, shortly, um, you know, just a few pages in, and, and I really like this, um, this statement. She's kind of st starting to tell a little bit about her, her dad. Um, and you know, she says, there's an accident. Um, after my sisters died over there in the States. That was before I was born. It's strange how childhood always seems completely normal until you grow up and start talking to other grown-ups about childhood. That's when you discover things, all the strange things. Only then do you see things clearly and realize that you always saw them clearly, right? Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about kind of like imagining like childhood and, and kind of coming to this um, perspective of this young woman who you just described as kind of being an echo. Yeah, I think that the, the idea behind that, um, it's like you have to, you have to, um, to compose your own past almost. Right. You have to go back and especially if you, if you have um, lived with, uh, with uh, a family history like, like, like the one in the book. And, the, and then uh, you have to, because there are so many things in a family that tend to get uh, not talked about or hidden away and, and people always like to protect kids from, from certain things. So, um, so my, my character, she's called Mar Marita, and, uh, and, and, and the thing about the, the book is that um, there's, uh, the marriage is between their, the, an American father and a Norwegian woman that comes to New York in the 50s, and they fall in love, get married, have these two daughters, and then they, they die in an accident, and then the couple move back to Norway to see if they can patch up things together. And they, it's a relationship that has a broken back almost. And, and they try to start a new life in Norway and that doesn't work out good either. But all the things that they try to like, protect the child from and, and, uh, and suddenly at a at certain point, uh, uh, Johnny, the father and Marita, they come back to the United States in the summer of 75. And she's like six years, seven or eight years old or something. And, uh, and, and the father takes her back to the place where the accident happened. And then he breaks apart and then he falls up to pieces. And then it's, and, and that's another idea that I want to explore in the book. It's, it's about, there's been a lot of literature in Norway for the last years about the relationships between fathers and sons. Karl Ove Knausgård, I'm probably sure you know him. Big, big hit in Norway and all over the world. And, and uh, I wanted to, to do that with, uh, with the father and the daughter. And, uh, and the idea of uh, how um, some children are their parents' keepers almost. They, they watch out for the parents and, and that sort of 
child has always intrigued me as a liter literary figure. What happens when the, when the relationship is reversed and the child is the one that has to look out for their parents and, and, and make sure that they are you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a good place? So that happens in 75 when they come back to, to the United States that the father just tells the child all about the accident and says, don't tell your mother I told you this. So there's another thing going on right. there because right. the mother is a, just a whole different case in the book. Yeah. Um, as I said, this book, you know, it sets up early the fact that there's been this accident and you, you early on have this um, understanding of the grief that's affected this family. The two parents are uh, Johnny and Kari, Kari. And um, there's this really interesting passage that happens before we even, pardon me, has my microphone. Maybe I'll use the other one. Thank you. Um, as I was just saying, there's, before we have, have a sense of the accident that has taken place, um, uh, Pedro builds this sense of uh, kind of an anticipation of the grief in this, uh, I think, really lovely way. Um, and this is from page 59. They will remember that Johnny gets ready in five minutes while Kari has to put up her hair, try on different earrings that she keeps coming in and out of the bedroom where Johnny is lying on the bed reading the newspaper. She asks about which shoes, which dress. He will remember her perfume, which she will never use again. They will see the short stroll over to the Terry and Mona's house across the street, a slightly cold breeze, a plastic bag that never succeeds in taking flight like a dog chasing its own tail on the pavement, they will remember Terry and Mona's living room and the welcome drinks. The evening will pass slowly, as if underwater. Beer bottles on the table, the plans for a Sunday outing, the playful teasing about Terry and Mona must soon think about making another baby so that little Ronald can stop running after our girls. Records and cigarettes, the top hits of the day. For a moment, everything stands still, like in a drawing. Um, so, moving from this kind of incantation of loss and grief, um, but I, before we move on, I, I do feel like we should talk a little bit about the relationship between the father and daughter, um, because there's this, you know, it sounds like this kind of sad book, but I feel like as we kind of move through toward the end of this book, there's this real sense of hopefulness or connection or... Um, you know, I, I don't know a good way to describe that kind of tenderness or affinity between the father and the daughter, but I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, the thing is that um, Johnny is, a, is, a, is an American man that lives in Norway, and it just, it's not that easy for him to do that. So the daughter becomes like an ally in, in that sense, not just because the daughter is the one that he can talk to about the grief that he feels inside because Kari, the, his wife, is not very eager to talk about it anymore. She just wants to forget things and move on, and although that's impossible, obviously. But um, another thing that I wanted to explore about the, the Johnny's his, his, his role in the book was that he is born, he was born here in the US, but it doesn't actually, um, um, discovers his own American thing un until he gets to Norway and, and sees this country from a distance, from afar. And he has been a guy that he listens to jazz music and his mother is very fond of jazz music. And, but then he comes to Norway and because he's from New Jersey and he comes to Norway in the 60s and Bruce Springsteen, he puts out his first album in 73 and a friend of his sends him the album and says, you should listen to this guy, he's from Freehold, you know, he's really good. And he says, I don't like that kind of music. But in Norway, he suddenly starts ex exploring his own, uh, his own roots, maybe, through the music of a the very young Bruce Springsteen, which is a, a completely uh, other character than he is today, you know. In 73, he was a skinny guy, talking about very local things. So Johnny starts um, 
connecting with his own uh, roots through the music. And, and that, he passes that on to his daughter. And that too becomes the, the, the well, an element in the relationship between them. The music, the American music, and, the, and not just Bruce Springsteen, but the whole thing. It's just uh, how is this country uh, um, made up? Of what kind of dreams are you, are you uh, using to make up the idea of being American? And, that, and he sees that from Norway. And he passes that on to the daughter, and the book ends with it, this is not a, a uh, you know, it's it's not that kind of book. So I can tell you how it ends. <laughs> so he he actually takes her to this uh, the Bruce Springsteen concert in in Norway in '81 when Bruce Springsteen was uh, on the Great River tour, and uh, and that is sort of, and then he leaves, and then he goes back to the United States. And I'm actually now finishing the second part of the of the book, which. Um, Johnny goes back to New York and then goes to California, and uh, and she she comes here when she's grown up. So yeah, because there are so many Californians in the room, uh, can you just touch on how California has captured your imagination and why California? Oh, this this country is really fascinating. <laughs> I have been uh, obsessed with with your music since I was a kid. Really, and that's my my entrance to, to to the United States and the language and songs and the, and the music. And it started with you know Bruce Springsteen and Neil Young and Bob Dylan and all that when I was 12, 13. And then you kind of go deeper and you get to uh, you get to you know uh, listen to the old really good blues music, Rob Johnson and Blind Willie Jefferson and all that. And then you tap into the the really, really old, the weird old America, like Grail Marcus has written so beautifully about. And, and I, I mean, I'm an American too. I was born in Chile, I was born in South America, and I think that the whole America has a lot of things in common. We're, we're a continent that was invented, you know? F I mean, 1,500 years after everything else was invented. So we got everything in, in one go. And, uh, and this is a mythical, for me, the, the American continent is a mythical place. And that is very well reflected in the music and in the arts. So, so I don't know, the California, is, isn't that where you went if you didn't have anywhere else to go? You just wanted to reinvent yourself and, and you know, be somebody else. That's the whole thing about the America. You can go here and put on another mask and another name and become some, some, some other person. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, well, I'd like to talk a little bit with Jonas Carlson about his book, The Room, uh, which, like I said, is available now, but I also want to hear about his forthcoming book, The Invoice, which is especially relevant to our conversation today. Um, the Room, for any of those of you, you know, literary people out there who, I don't know, love Herman Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener, um, and want to kind of think of or experience kind of a contemporary version where maybe Bartleby is this very strange man who's narrating a story, and instead of being someone who doesn't do anything, he is actually extremely industrious. Um, the Room is, I think, uh, f fantastic and hilarious and strange. Um, I feel like to, to kind of situate us in this book, you, you simply start at the beginning where uh, the, the main character is Bjorn. Yeah. And Bjorn, Bjorn starts the book like this. The first time I walked into the room, I turned back almost at once. I was actually trying to find the toilet but got the wrong door. A musty smell hit me when I opened the door, but I don't remember thinking much about it. I hadn't actually noticed there was anything at all along this corridor leading to the lifts apart from the toilets. Oh, I thought, a room. I opened the door, then shut it. No more than that. So as the book unfolds, we get to know Bjorn and his office and his colleagues, and the room becomes a little bit more mysterious. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> it it does uh, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, um, you know, when I when I write my stories, bec because I they are not very long. They are like we said, novella length stories. 
I, I just start writing uh, without having any idea where, yeah. where I'm going. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no kind of frame. Yeah. I just start writing, and I start with uh, an idea. You know, it could be a situation that I've been in, or, or a line or two that I've heard, or, or something that I said, or, or something that someone else might have said, or something that I didn't dare say myself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I just start writing. And sometimes I, I come across something deeper, or, or what you would call it, some something bigger. And this time, I was actually, because I'm an actor as well, uh, working in the theatre in Stockholm, the Royal Dramatic Theatre. And uh, we were playing uh, Eugene O'Neill's uh, long, A Long Day's Journey Into Night. Uh, and I were playing uh, Edmund, uh, the younger brother. Sure. You know that play, don't you? Yeah. And, and Edmund, uh, he's the sick brother, and, and he, he doesn't appear on stage uh, in, in the second part of the play. He doesn't appear on stage for like half an hour or 40 minutes or something. So I had, I had some time sitting in the wings, <laughs> 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 watching my fellow actors on stage. Yeah. And, and then I, I, I used to sit there uh, and lean my head against the wall. And one night it struck me that, that my side of the wall seemed much shorter than on the other side of the because of the on the other side of the wall there was this corridor leading to the main stage uh, and there was this big sofa there where all the actors used to sit gossip about you know other actors and directors and stuff yeah. <laughs> so i started thinking uh, but if this side is much shorter i even counted the wallpapers you know <laughs> and and then i went back and forth a few times comparing, and, and it was much shorter on my side. So something was wrong. <laughs> <You know? laughs> then I realized that there had to be something else here, you know, if it's shorter on my side. And then I started to fantasize about this secret room that perhaps the, the theater, <laughs> you know, it's because fantastic. Ingmar Bergman was at this theater at this time, and I was, you know, I was imagining Ingmar Bergman sitting in there in this secret room, <laughs> writing in his little black notebook about, you know, well, evil brilliant. actors or something. So, so <laughs> and, and then we, we, we did the show, and after the show, I went round the corner, and then I discovered there was this old smoking room there, of course, you know, that I, I just forgot about. So, end of mystery. But, but by the time I had this idea about the secret room, uh, but I guess what I didn't know at that time was that the, the room was a, about to be even more secret. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think this book is so interesting for so many reasons. Uh, but you, you know, kind of with that as a context, you, you, you know, that may have served as kind of a, you know, an idea, a seed that was planted in your imagination. You write this book in a contemporary office setting, um, where right. where the you know the main character is is clearly very odd. <laughs> uh, how did how did you come up with it being in an office? He is. I I, <laughs> I, I must admit he, he he is he is kind of peculiar. Um, I think the thing is, you know, I. I I didn't know where to end. I didn't. I didn't know what yeah. to, where. Yeah. You know what's gonna what's gonna happen. So so I just started writing, and then I sort of because in the beginning I imagined that it was I walking into this strange room. Because what happens is that Bjorn is is uh, entering this room, and and he feels very good about himself in this room. He he's he's also able to be very efficient inside this room. But the thing is that his colleagues, his, uh, he, he, they, they, they don't see the room. So they, they just see him standing in the, you know, in the corner. So there is a kind of conflict there. <laughs> but, <laughs> to put but, it mildly. But, but when I started, I, I more or less thought that this was I walking into the room. And then I, then I sort of took my, my uh, some, some bad habits of myself <laughs> and, and just turned them up. <laughs> And, and I created this uh, character, this person that became someone that was, you know, partly me, but, but 
absurdly <laughs> <laughs> tuned up. Right. So I had this kind of monster, <laughs> right. uh, and that was that was that was both very exciting and quite scary, mm. because you know when I when I was sitting writing there, I, I sometimes had to stop writing and think, no, this is too crazy. This is you know <laughs> this guy is too weird. <laughs> And he's acting both. I mean, I mean both the the the, the obviously absurd thing about uh, seeing a, a room that no one else can see, but also the way he interact with other people. And and I think that's the sort of uh, um, the the scary thing. Will or, or or when when you read this, I I think it's both the the thing with the room, but also the thing that. The fact that Bjorn is so awkward and so uh, s social inept, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and um, yeah, that's it, also scary. <laughs> it is, but you know, sometimes strangely true to life, too. You know, like this person, he's very, very strange. But you can almost imagine him being in an office. Um, <laughs> well, you know, you kind of have a sense of the conceit behind the room. This kind of you know, this character who imagines a room for himself in his office space. Um, Jonas's newest book called The Invoice also has a conceit um, that again is, is relevant to, to this conversation about time and memory and uh, you know, the way we look back on our lives. Uh, and I think we should hear a little bit about The Invoice and I think maybe if you could read a little bit from it as well. Well, I, I would love to. This this book is um, um, it's called the Invoice. It's it's out in July. It's um, uh, as as I told you, I, I I never know where where it's going to end when I when I start writing. And and this was uh, I I was coming to my uh, my little writing place and and just feeling very good about myself, uh, at ease with myself and and and. And, but my first reaction wasn't, oh, what a wonderful day, what should I do with this day? It was, or the contrary, it was more like, uh-oh, am I really allowed to feel like this, <laughs> you know, for free? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I, because I was just happy for no particular reason, you know, uh, and that, uh, you know that feeling, don't you? <laughs> and, and at that moment I got this idea that, that uh, this main character, he's, he, he receives this invoice one day, for for the total amount of his experienced happiness, <laughs> because because at the time when I wrote it, it seemed like a personal, re perfectly reasonable idea. You know <laughs> that I, if I would have received one of those invoices, I would have paid it right away. <laughs> <laughs> because who am I feeling happy like this when we know the world is you know, yeah. So, but, but do you want yeah, me to I'd, read I'd, it? I'd, yeah. I think we should hear from this book. Uh, this is when, uh, well, he receives this invoice, and obviously he thinks this is, uh, this something must be wrong here. You know, uh, they have mistaken me for for some uh, big company or something. Uh, so he he calls the authority, and there is a woman there. He he's in a telephone queue for like twelve hours or something, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but, but then. <laughs> Uh, after a while he gets through and, and, and this is his conversation with the woman in the other end and the woman says have you got beta or link the woman said on, on the phone what did you say I said well which payment system have you signed up with no idea I said I, I don't think I got one at all no she said no but you do have a plan. A plan? You got a payment plan linked to your e-age account. I waited a moment. No, I don't think so, I said. You haven't registered? She said. No, I said. Sh should I have? She didn't say anything for a while, so I repeated the question. Is, is that something I should have done? She cleared her throat. Well, let me put it like this. Yes. <laughs> I felt a sudden urge to sit down. But what, what am I supposed to be paying for? I said. What? She said. Yes, everything, she said. What do you mean everything, I asked. Where are you calling from? She asked. 
Well, well, I'm at home, I said. At home, okay. Look around you. What can you see? I raised my eyes from the floor and looked around the room. Well, I, I see my kitchen, I said. So, what can you see there? Uh, uh, the sink, some dirty dishes, uh, a table. Look out the window. Okay. I stood up and went over to the kitchen window, which was open slightly. I had left it open all night, maybe a few days, I couldn't remember. The heat had more or less, more or less erased the boundary between outside and in. The other day I had a bird in the kitchen for what must have been half an hour. I don't know what sort it was, but it was very pretty. What can you see outside? The woman asked down the phone. Buildings, I said, a few trees. Yeah, and what else? More buildings, the street, a few cars, what else? I can see uh, blue sky, the sun, a few clouds, people, children playing on the pavement, adults, shops, cafes, people out together. Exactly. Can you smell anything? Uh, yes. You feel something, can't you? The woman continued. You're feeling feelings, thinking of different things, friends and acquaintances, and I presume you have dreams. She was no longer bothering for wait, uh, to wait for me to reply. What do you mean, I said. Do you dream at night? She went on. Well, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you imagine all that is free? <laughs> I didn't say anything for a while. Well, well I, I suppose I thought, is that really what you thought? She said. I tried to come up with, re with a reply, but my thoughts were going round in circles without formulating themselves into any sort of order. The woman, the woman on the phone went on giving a long explanation of the divisions of costs, resolutions, single payments and deduction systems. It sounded almost as if she knew it off by heart. But how can it amount to so much, I said, when I could speak again. Well, she said, being alive costs. I said nothing for a while because I didn't know what to say, but I eventually said, I had no idea it was so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, it's hard to follow up. <laughs> I, I think I um, but I, I but I guess my my you know the question that comes to mind you know the the, the thoughtful question is you know by writing this book and you know I imagine you can't help but think you know what what is the value of our our memories you know what what value do we put on these things that we've experienced in our lives and you know what was that kind of experience for you like as, as you're writing this book? Well, I, I think I should add to this uh, uh, for making it more clearly that the invoice is, the sum of the invoice is uh, on uh, 5 million 700 thousand kronor. <laughs> so, it's, so it's quite a sum. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, I, I was thinking, and, and the thing is that, that as the story goes along, he's, he is uh, the main character, is of course uh, forced to revalue what he, because he is living uh, just an ordinary life, part-time work in a video store, and <laughs> you know, he doesn't even have a girlfriend, or, or, and so on. I think, I, I come to think about many things writing this, but I, I, I think one thing is that, there are so many things in life that we're, uh, I think we, we're, we're constantly striving for, you know, more money, mm. more love and passion in our lives. We want more power, more success. All, all of those things, if you just take them and sort of twist them just a little, they quite fast turn into something very different. So it's, so it's very hard, you know, saying, is, th is this really a good thing for me? Or, right. or, or I is it actually bad? You know, yeah. did I, did I, should I, how, how should I have done? You know, you, you can't really tell. It's just, uh, well, I, I mean, in one, in, one, in one way, I guess you could say the book is, is like an ex a study in extreme contentment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that study in, yes. Um, <laughs> 
you know, the, the book also seems to explore, you know, what, what I feel like, you know, especially those of us who live in the Bay Area, you know, the way in which everything in our lives is monetized. You know, there are all these things that have costs. Was that something that you were also thinking about? In, in it was, and I, absolutely. And I think, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know about the US, but in Sweden we have this urge to measure everything. <laughs> right, right. We, we, we like to measure all kinds of stuff, you know, whether it's a, and ranking it, you know, whether it's about the coffee or, or, or the school, the education system, you know, you, you, you like to measure wh which is the best school and what, or, or the healthcare system, you know, even things that perhaps can't really be measured. <laughs> and I found it very, very funny to, you know, uh, exactly. approach that on, on, on one of the, the most uh, soft subjects of them all, <laughs> happiness. <laughs> right. Right. Because w you always get those, those rankings, you know, th this is the best city to live in. <laughs> right. And, and it's, 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 it's very often uh, Oslo or, <laughs> or Copenhagen or, or Canada, you, you know, people, th this is the best city. Yes. And, and uh, I'm... I don't know what to say about it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's terrific. Uh, well, I want to give, uh, you know, we, we should also give some time to, to kind of build on this idea of kind of looking on your, your life, uh, reflecting on the experiences of your life. Um, and, and I feel like the, this book, The Faster I Walk, The Smaller I Am, is, is kind of the appropriate um, uh, follow-up. Um, by Kirsty Skomsvold. Um, this book is really the story of a, of a woman at the end of her life. She's, she's old. She constantly refers to her age and, and her, her experience of old age. Um, but what's, what's kind of interesting about her is she's very attuned to the th thoughts about death and her ending, um, even if she's also, um, you know, what's, what's, what's really um, captivating about this narrative, I think, is that although she has these moments of remembrance, she, you also just feel like she's, she's living in the present. Um, and I'm really curious to hear how you came to discover this character that you wanted to write about. Uh, Matea uh, is her name. Uh, I think I just wanted to write a book about death, the joyful subject death. Um, <laughs> this is a kind of a funny book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it would be unbearable to write it about death if I wasn't able to laugh at the same time. Um, I was sort of isolated at the time, and I think you can only be alone for a certain amount of time before your mind starts to think about these things and more existential concerns. Um, and I was also ill and I didn't feel like a human being, but I thought that a novel has to be written by a human. So if I'm able to write a, hu a novel, I'll start to feel like a human being again. And I, sta I, wasn't, yeah, I started to write about this old woman on yellow post-it notes that I put above my bed. And it turned into this book. Uh, it took a long time, four years, um, and I wanted her to be old because I wanted her to be close to death in time. And I found her like at the end of these four years, and that's the strange thing with writing a novel. You can work for years and years and nothing seems to happen, and then when you understand the internal logic of the book and you find this character's voice or her language, then a lot can happen just in the past, uh, the last few months of before the book goes to print. And um, yeah, Matea, um, yeah, I think it was when I found her language that I think the language of the character has to meet the language of the author, and that's when uh, she becomes sort of a real human being. And it was when I found out that she was strange and chose these quirky words and things that I found her. Um, and the novel starts with, after her husband's funeral, she's just back uh, from her husband's funeral, and she 
talks to him in present tense and right. refers to him in past tense. And that was because I wanted the reader to feel the same confusion as she does, because they have been living together their whole lives and suddenly she's all alone and she, she's scared of dying before anyone knows that she has lived. And that's what the book is about. Right. Um, to give everyone a sense kind of of the, the tone or the, the character, you know, I feel like you were talking about the language of the book. Um, you know, she, she does have this, you know, these conversations with her husband, even if he's not there. Um, her husband, uh, she calls Epsilon. Yeah. yeah. And um, this is early on in the book. Um, the laws of nature are in direct conflict with our individual interests, Epsilon said. Isn't that what I've always told you? I asked him. Ever since Stein died, Epsilon had, bo had his nose buried in a book. What are you reading? I asked. I'm reading what Schopenhauer has to say about death, Epsilon said. I'm trying to make peace with the fact that Stein's gone. But you're religious, I said. No, I'm not, Epsilon said. Oh, so you're hoping to find some other enduring meaning for Stein, I asked. Epsilon nodded, something like that. Does Schopenhauer have anything useful to say? I asked. Well, the part where he says that Stein will continue on as an expression of the world's will seems a bit much, Epsilon said. But the thought that he'll live on in the species of dog, there may be something to that. So there are these kind of charming and strange moments that happen throughout the book. One, one of my favorites is she, she decides to create a time capsule um, for herself. Yeah, well, and first the Schopenhauer yeah. thing, people told me to read Schopenhauer, that would help if I was scared of dying and didn't believe in a life after death. Uh, <laughs> but it didn't really, so that's why I thought I <laughs> that I had to write a novel, and maybe that nice. would help, but nice. it didn't help e either. Um, um, yeah, and what did you say now? The, oh, no, I was the, sorry, the, oh, the time, time capsule. Book. Yeah, she walks around in her, she's been living at the same place the whole time, and she walks around in this apartment to and to figure out what her life has meant. And I think it was started to say that we live our lives in one direction and then we make stories of them in the opposite mm. direction with a beginning, a middle and an end. But this al always falsifies things because there is nothing as a, that is a true story. But mm. we can't help think that it is because we want to make meaning of life. Mm. And we try to imagine what our life would look like if we wrote a biography. Uh, on our deathbed, sort right. of like Matea. But uh, since we don't know what the end will be like, we are also doomed to misunderstand the present. And that's what is always happening. We misunderstand the present because we haven't seen the consequences right. of it yet. And it makes it so, the present is very difficult to handle. But I think she's sort of, she's, she's reflecting on these stories from the past with her husband Epsilon because her life with her husband Epsilon suddenly means something else when he is gone. And she realizes that maybe she has been lonely the whole time, even though he has been there. And so there are these stories from the past that is pulled in to sort of understand, yes, so that she, she's trying to understand the present too. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one, one of the things that I really like about this book is the way you kind of introduce these, you know, they're like quotations or they're references, but they're, it's kind of done in a coy way, um, you know, where what one of the characters will say, you know, we have to live in the present, um, or like time is everything. Um, I like that uh, Hans Christian Andersen makes, makes an appearance at, at one point in the book um, uh, where uh, he says, you know, yeah. Didn't Hans Christian Andersen say, to travel is to live? And then there's a break. Uh, I think he also said action is all that gives life meaning. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about how when you were like, writing this book, clearly you were you know, trying to encapsulate some of these things into, into the book? Yeah. Um Mateo, even though she's so isolated and she doesn't talk to other people, she sort of finds these quotes and make them work for her. And, uh, 
uh, yeah, action is what counts. She is starting to take small actions after right. Epsilon has died to make her life mean something. And it's not huge things, it's just going to the grocery store and maybe talking a bit to, to the old, old guy asking about the time right. he stands there. And it is a novel about time too. It's called The Faster I Walk, The Smaller I Am because mm. that's uh, a consequence of the relativity theory. Right. And I thought it fitted because it is about time and also because she's always hurrying away from people and that makes her much smaller uh, mm. than, she, than she needs to be. Mm. But yeah, the quotes, I guess it is um, sort of the same as with literature, the shock mm. of recognition. Sometimes <laughs> you hear a quote and you recognize yourself in right. it. Um, and I thought about another Einstein quote while writing it. Um, the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. <laughs> right. And I right. continued to think about that when I wrote my next novel, um, which is more autobiographical. The main character is called Shasti, the same as me. And then sometimes the present was too unbearable to go into because I was writing about the time and Shasti was mm. ill and writing this book. Mm. And what helped was to think about time more as something vertical than horizontal. So that uh, I also there wrote about um, things happening in the past, that, uh, and, but also I had to go and tell Shasti about things that would happen in the future so that she knew that things would get better. Uh, so if I wrote the book now, I could tell her that in the future you will be visiting San Francisco and <laughs> it would be right. easier for, for the main character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I found the book very um, you know, thoughtful and, and charming and, and just these describing how some of these um, moments unfold in the book and, and some of them are, are kind of, you kind of back into uh, a funny idea, like she has a a box, and it it's you know her husband makes a box for her, and it's almost as if it's a you know not quite a coffin, but she puts her knitting supplies in it, um, or she you know refers to memento mori, these kind of reminders of death. But she hears the term memento mori and thinks, is that like an illness that maybe I should avoid catching? Um, you turned this book into a play and you know what how how did that come about I mean was that you know did you kind of feel like this was a character you wanted to live with and felt like should live on the stage as well um, no I didn't um, it was uh, an actress from the National Theatre who called me and it was after my first um, job sort of to mm. do a reading and I was standing in the street of Sarpsburg, this small <laughs> town in Norway and everyone was just walking past and no one stopped to listen and then afterwards I got this text from this actress who said I want to do this at the National Theatre so it was sort of <laughs> very extreme things <laughs> happening at once and we worked on it together and uh, put it up as a play at the National Theatre. Mm. Well, it's pretty incredible. Uh, well, we have a little bit more time uh, in this session. I, I feel like we should open it up to some, some questions you may have. Oh, oh, sure, sure, sure. Just before that, we, Jean, please. Yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to add something very personal. Uh, the topic is called Confronting the Past. And so I just wanted to say how it was really adequate for me. Uh, 1986, uh, uh, 1982, I lost my father and, uh, sorry, my mother and my brother in a car crash. And 1986, my father in another car crash. So I was 22. I inherited the money, but I didn't want it. So what I decided to do, because I just wanted to start from scratch, uh, altogether a new life, as you said, reinventing myself. So the thing that I did is that uh, I paid a, a trip uh, for my girlfriend, uh, my best friend at that time, and me, and we went to San Francisco. Uh, that was my first time abroad, all right, for two weeks, and then the rest of California for a month. 
And that's how I reinvented myself, actually. Right. Well, it's, it's wonderful to have you back in the Bay. Um, for what must be a, a special place. Yeah, when I saw, yeah, when, when I saw, when I saw the first topic, you know, confronting the bus, I said, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we created this specifically for Jean Fleet. Um, sir, you have a question. And I'm just going to repeat that so everyone can hear. The question was, you know, did, did you consider, uh, in the case of all the panelists, did you consider, you know, clearly very strong English speakers. I cannot speak Norwegian. Um, you know, did you consider uh, crafting your book in English, being the book's translator into English? No, I, I knew I couldn't. Uh, I mean, we talked about that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you have, when you talk about intimate matters, then... It's your mother tongue when you have the exact word, right, for feelings, for things. And, and then you just can't trans and, and then, so I decided to trust, of course, the translator. And then when I read it afterwards, I said, oh my God, how did you find that? That's exactly the way to put it, right? And I, I was very pleased with the translation, but I had, you know, I was very stressed out. I had to read the book in English. Uh, in Shakespeare and Co, of a very famous bookshop in Paris. And in front of an English-speaking audience, and, and I was just like, oh, <laughs> am I going to do that right? No, I, I didn't want to, to translate it. I think this is a job, and this is not mine, actually. Well, um, I, I, I involved myself quite a bit in the translation of the book because I, I don't know if it's the, the ego or something, <laughs> but I, I thought that I knew something about the tone of her, of Marita's voice, and I just and the book also includes my book includes a lot of hidden um, quotes and and filtered quotes and uh, reworked quotes of uh, songs, Bruce Springsteen songs and Dylan songs and all kinds of song lyrics that I just translated or filtered to Norwegian and then they had to go back to English again. So I, I kind of knew how I wanted them to sound. So I was really involved in the translation, yeah. Yeah, I was a bit involved too. And uh, because the character is, uh, well, she chooses strange words. So the difficult thing was to make the character seem odd and not the translator. So we had to work a bit on that. I have such a good translator, he's called Neil Smith, uh, who is a wonderful guy, uh, and I trust him uh, fully. And I think the beauty of it, because, I mean, you win some and you lose some in a translation, it's, it's just the way it is. But I, I actually, I think, in some, some, uh, some paragraphs even came out better <laughs> in English, because it's, it's the beauty of language, you know, some, some things are, are easier to tell in a different language. And and vice versa, so. And, and yeah. For example, uh, one, at the end of one chapter, when, she, when Cecile realizes the, the man that is going to sit next to her, she says in French, catastrophe, catastrophe. And the translator chose, oh my God. And I would never, and I would never have done it because for me, oh my God is Chandler Pink in France. I mean, it's not, oh my God. And, but that was exactly the feeling, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just want to take a moment to, to recognize uh, some of the translators of these books. Uh, for Jean-Philippe Blondel, it's uh, Alison Anderson. Um, for Pedro, uh, Diane Oatley. Uh, for Jonas, Neil Smith. Um, for Chersty, it's uh, Carrie Pierce. And really, they are excellent translations. Uh, I'll go here, yes. Um, oh, thank you. Okay. Because um, you're talking about a deep memory of something that happened before the main character. And you're from Chile, and I assume that you probably came after the overthrow of Allende because the timing. 
Um, do you think that deep memory of that tragedy um, kind of outlined or sent a direction for you and what you were writing about? Oh, I'm sure <laughs> it has a lot of, a lot of, uh, yeah, it's very, very relevant. The, the novel I wrote before this one is called Rust. It's very, very big novel. It's like 900 pages. And it's a, a really, it's a good novel. <laughs> and, uh, and that novel has, uh, has uh, I, I was trying to confront m my own political past, my parents' past in that novel. So when I started writing this book, I thought I was not go And that novel had a lot of music as well because it, it was about uh, this Chilean refugee kid who came to Norway, and then he went back to Latin America as a political revenger, as a terrorist, maybe, and, 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 and killed a lot of people. And, uh, and, and I th when I wrote this one, I thought, I'm not going to write about uh, exile, or nostalgia, and memory, or music. That was the thing. And, and, the, and, and I mean, that's the thing about literature. I, I, I remember I read this interview with uh, Rosemary Waldrop, the, the very um, American poet, excellent poet, and she said that she uh, started experimenting with cut-ups and college, uh, colleges in, in her poetry because she didn't want to write uh, more poems about her mother. And then after experimenting with all these techniques, cut-up techniques and stuff, she still wrote poems about her mother. <laughs> so, I mean, you can't you can run away from it. So, um, my experience as a child uh, has obviously a lot to do with uh, the kind of thing that I mentioned about being the kind of uh, the kind of child that uh, had to grow up very very fast. It was like my childhood was, was over in like yeah a minute, and uh, and then you had to be another person and take care of people around you because everything was uh, falling apart. So yeah. Mm. I'm, he's been the subject of a lot of attention and, and fascination in the United States, but also a certain amount of criticism directed at him for being self-indulgent, even solipsistic. I'm curious about whether you think that his method of accessing memory, memory as download, will be influential, and whether it's at all attractive to you for purposes of your work. Mm, I went into a... Uh, a bookstore in New York, and I wanted to see if they had my book, so I asked if they had a book by the Norwegian writer Skumsvoll, and then she came back with Knausgård. Knausgård. <laughs> 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 um, well, my second novel is more uh, autobiographical, too, and I use my own name, because I read a sentence by Michel de Montaigne, uh, there's nothing more useful and nothing harder than self-description. And it changes everything when you use your own name. But uh, I can only answer for myself. I don't know. I can't answer for Knausgård. Um, but in many ways, I feel closer to the character in this book than the char character in my second novel, even though she has my name and the same background as me. And uh, Blanchot, he said about uh, Kierkegaard, that the more he writes about himself, the more he hides. And I think that's very interesting. And I feel the same way. I feel like I'm pointing at this book, saying, Shashti is over there. And then everyone is looking there. And I sort of go free. So I, s I think you have to use your imagination no matter what you're writing about. And, and like the anecdote you told, I think literature wins. So whether you're trying to write something that is true or uh, if you change it and it becomes better literature, then that's what you end up doing. So you can't sort of compare it to the truth anyway. But uh, writing about, well, using other people's name, I was very, I took that very seriously because it is a big thing to have your name in a book. Mm. I would say I, I, I don't think I ever will write anything autobiographical, actually. It's, it's not my style. <laughs> but that said, I think it's a wonderful feeling when, when I'm, as I said before, I'm just writing and writing and see what happens. And when I, when I discover something, uh, it's a wonderful feeling that I, when I realize that this is actually about that thing that I was experiencing, and, uh, and I'm able to sort of put it in my story in a different context with different people.
perhaps even a different situation, but it, but it reminds me about what I've been through, and, I, and I'm able to create it myself. That's what I love about writing, because then I can sort of create a new world based on my experiences. And I think that Knausgård's uh, big strongest thing is that he, he makes uh, literature look really easy. He, he, I mean, it's it's easily read and it's uh, it, it's uh, deep on some levels and it's you know banal on some levels. But what he did when when the books first came out in Norway in 2012 or nine or something to 2009, and they became huge hits because everybody else is trying to construct a story and plot out characters and stuff. And then he suddenly said, "Well, I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to write, and the writing is the important thing." And, and it looks very, very easy. And uh, I, have, uh, I had the same experience reading another uh, really uh, strong author uh, called Roberto Bolaño. He was Chilean. He died in 2003. But when I discovered him in the, in the 90s, in the uh, late 90s, it was the same thing. He makes you want to write. He wa makes you want to write books, and he makes you want to read books because it, it looks so easy. And, uh, and the way Knausgård explores his own past and, and how, he, um, how he is so reckless about doing it, it doesn't matter. He hurts in Norway, I, I don't, I'm not sure you know about all this, but I mean there were a whole family was really, really pissed off at him because he uses them in the books. You know, and, and how, is that his right to do as an artist? You know, is the artist above everybody else? Can I, as a, an author, do anything I want to my wife or my kids or my parents because my art is more important than your life? And that's really a big debate and it's an important one because it's how are we viewing, you know, the artist? Am I allowed to do whatever just because I write books? I don't think so. I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to take this gentleman in the far back. Well, back him. <laughs> I think he's just waiting for the microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, hi, this question is for anybody on the panel and for everybody on the panel. The topic is confronting the past do you think as authors, maybe a better word could have been uh, engaging the past so as to not be so antagonistic, although conflict is in, inherent in literature, and maybe it would be more productive to say not confronting the past, but engaging it so as to, you know, help the reader with whatever traumatic events the reader has also had in the past, no matter how traumatic they were, an accident, a sour love affair, death, whatever. Is confronting the past too confrontational? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just kind of say that you know, we, I don't think anyone on this panel actually chose the language for how we were going to describe this particular panel. Um, but I, uh, I believe it was the Bay Area Book Festival. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, but I think you're you're absolutely right. I think that sometimes when we look back on past or in memory, we we aren't. It isn't necessarily confrontational. Sometimes we, we don't even realize that the past is kind of welling up inside us. Um, I think sometimes, you know, maybe anyone in this room has had some emotional or powerful moment in their lives that, you know, it hits you unexpectedly in places where you wouldn't have looked for it. Um, and sometimes you do directly engage with the past. Sometimes you avoid the past and run into the past uh, regardless. Um, uh, I just want to thank everyone who joined us today to, for this conversation, and I want to add a round of applause for these wonderful writers. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's worth adding that, you know, they have come far. <laughs> um, so, you know, Jean-Philippe Blondel, Jonas Carlson, Kirsty Skomsvold, Pedro, Carmona Alvarez, thank you so much. Thank you.